Hi, everyone, and thank you for joining us for our webinar today. We are glad to have you. Um, I'm going to go over a few housekeeping items before I turn it over to our presenters. The audio should stream automatically upon entry through your computer speakers. If you're unable to stream your audio, then, then please click this phone icon that I have highlighted here, and a dial-in number will be sent to you. You're also able to download a copy of the PowerPoint slides by clicking the file and then selecting Save as a PDF type. And we're also offering CLE credit for the program, so please uh, remember the four keywords that'll, that I will come on the line and give you throughout the program. Um, then you'll have to email me. I'll give you the CLE form in order to submit those course codes and just uh, send it back to me. And I'll go ahead and give the first code word now, which will be hospital. So the first CLE word is hospital. And with that, I'll turn it over to our moderator, Mr. Mark Kajelski. Mark? Great, thank you very much. I uh, appreciate the uh, opportunity once again to present our quarterly webinar from the Healthcare Services uh, group at Pepper Hamilton. Uh, this quarterly webinar is on the topic of antitrust in healthcare. And I note from the registration list that we have attendees from all over the country, from California to Maine to Florida, and we have folks who are from hospitals, from health insurers, from healthcare providers of all sorts, large and small, as well as those who have business in the healthcare space. So this topic appears to be of great interest to everyone, and we're very pleased to present uh, some outstanding speakers uh, to discuss this with you in the next 55 minutes or so. And let me introduce our speakers uh, today. We have two of them. Uh, Barack Bassman is um, my partner and uh, is an expert not only in antitrust, but also has expertise in the managed care space. He is an outstanding lawyer with terrific experience in these areas, and he will be presenting to us an interesting case study uh, that is occurring now and giving us some opportunity to do some analysis of that case study. And next, but certainly not least, is one of our superstar associates, uh, Megan Morley. Megan is a terrific young antitrust lawyer. She's participated in a great victory we just had in Illinois in antitrust cases, and she's done terrific client counseling in the antitrust space and has done a wonderful job for us in presenting matters to clients and representing them very effectively in court proceedings. We have um, a great interest in this topic because at this time of uncertainty in healthcare, uh, particularly on the federal level, uh, no one really understands what's going to happen in the federal agencies, both at the Department of Justice and at the FTC in connection with antitrust decision making. There's also a concern that perhaps uh, private uh, entities will bring more private lawsuits in the antitrust area if the federal government and the federal agencies back off in this, in this, in, in this uh, ex area of expertise. But we don't know that either. And to present to us uh, on not only where we are in the antitrust area, but also talk about some current case studies, some very, very recent as of this week antitrust decisions, and maybe give us a little bit of flavor of where we think things are going. Here's our team of Barack Bassman and Megan Morley. Barack, take it away. Okay. Thank you, Mark. Uh, thank everyone for hopping on our program today. Uh, I'm going to be talking about a Department of Justice civil enforcement action that was commenced last fall that is very interesting and potentially has significant implications for how managed care contracting is done. So the case centers around the tension between payer attempts to create narrow networks and tiered networks uh, in order to drive costs down, in order to get you know, volume steered to the absolute lowest cost, most efficient provider, as opposed to stronger hospital systems that are often higher cost, fighting back on their contract terms and trying to limit those, you know, tiering 
and narrow network creation, sub-network creation, and carve-out rights. Uh, the fight here is in Charlotte, North Carolina. The defendant whom the Department of Justice is going after civilly is Carolina's healthcare system. They are the big player in Charlotte. They own 10 hospitals, they have 50% market share, and they're more than double the size of the next biggest competitor. So a little bit of just Managed Care 101. Uh, for context, as the, I can proceed in this discussion, uh, basically at an extremely high level, um, hospitals compete to be in networks of third-party payers, primarily health insurance companies, and offer discounts to get in network because they think they're going to get better volume because the payer is going to provide financial incentives to its members to access in-network facilities. Once you're in-network, um, then you compete against other in-network providers for patient volumes. Uh, and here the Department of Justice sort of grudgingly agreed in its complaint that Carolinas does offer some level of discounting in order to enter into different payers' networks. The Department of Justice is pursuing this case um, dealing with tiering rights and narrow network issues under Section 1 of the Sherman Act only. It is not a Section 2 monopolization case. The allegation is simply that the agreements that Carolinas has with the four large commercial payers in Charlotte, who are Local Blue Cross Plan, uh, United, Aetna, and Cigna, have unreasonably restrained trade in Charlotte. Uh, the product market is only inpatient hospital services, even though the, the contract clauses apply to physician, ancillary, and outpatient services. The DOJ is limiting its case to inpatient hospital. Uh, my guess being it's probably a lot harder to show market power if you start looking at those broader, you know, service lines. And it is only commercial payers, no Medicare, no Medicaid, no TRICARE, purely commercial. Uh, the geographic market is the Charlotte metropolitan area, and according to the DOJ, in that Charlotte metropolitan area, no payer can offer a viable, commercially, you know, tenable health insurance plan to brokers or employers or individuals unless at some level its networks and products include Carolinas. Thus it is in sort of antitrust healthcare parlance a must-have hospital. So what exactly did the Carolinas do? So according to the Department of Justice, their payer agreements prevent the creation of narrow networks that don't include them or tiered networks where they're not in the best tier, the tier that has the lowest out-of-pocket cost for a member to go to their facility. They did this either through an outright prohibition through a financial penalty or through triggering an early termination right. Uh, and again, the DOJ's theory is Carolinas can make or break unilaterally any health insurance competitor in its market because it is so necessary and desirable to the commercially insured population. Now, in terms of how these clauses restricting narrow networks that exclude Carolinas or trying to prevent adverse tiering of Carolina's hurt competition, what the Department of Justice says is if they didn't exist, the various payers in the market, Blue Cross or Aetna or United, would go to Carolina's competitors and say, if you give me some extra layer of discounting, some extra you know, special reimbursement rate, I will in turn create some sort of high performance narrow network product that I'll sell, say, as an alternative to a broad PPO network that will drive volume to you as against Carolinas, or I'll create tiering of my network and I'll give you the best tier position. And that way, you know, being able to go to Carolinas competitors and offer those options incentivizes further discounting. It's going to drive premiums down in the market, 
And what Carolina should be forced to do is to be a more efficient competitor itself and cut its prices. However, because Carolinas has prohibited in its contracts, so says the DOJ, narrow networks or tiered networks uh, that don't favor it, there's no incentive for its competitors to offer discounts to get better tiering or to have a narrow network because there's no upside. If the big kahuna in town, the guy you're really trying to drive, you know, get your volume from with the discounting is going to have to be treated equally to you, you don't get much bang for your buck by giving the extra discount. The DOJ is not seeking any monetary relief in this case. Um, and in fact, does not make any allegations of actual harm. So there's no, you know, allegation in the complaint along the lines of employers were forced to incur costs X percent higher because of these clauses. The only allegation is, is that the competitive process and the normal incentive structure that should lead to discounts were tripped up improperly. And so the DOJ wants an injunction now to stop that. Carolinas fought back um, and filed a motion for judgment on the pleadings, which is fully brief but not yet decided. Uh, for those of you interested in sort of the litigation inside baseball, the reason this is a motion for judgment on the pleadings and not a motion to dismiss is Carolina's lawyers decided to get a little cute and instead of moving to dismiss, they answered the complaint, attached all sorts of documents they think helped them to their answer, and then moved for judgment on the pleadings as a whole so they can try to use some of their cherry-picked documents in the motion properly. Um, ultimately, it probably will be decided like a standard motion to dismiss, high hurdle, uh, and even if they win, the DOJ is likely to replead and be allowed to replead. So I don't think this motion will be the end of the case, but it does preview really where the defenses are going to go. So what Carolina says is, what we're not doing is anti-competitive. What we're doing is normal pro-competitive behavior, and here's why. We sit down with Blue Cross Blue Shield of North Carolina, and we look at their membership and their market position, and we say, we think they can drive X amount of volume to us if we are in their networks. And we are going to price a discount to them based on that. So we, you know, go, go and network with them, give them a discount on the expectation of a certain volume. Blue Cross now has our discount. Blue Cross then takes the fact of our participation as Carolinas out to the broker and employer community and markets that and says, we have the biggest, best hospital system in town, you know, to offer to, you know, your clients, your employees, sign up for our products. What Carolinas then says is, all we're trying to do is after having given this discount to the, to the payer and after having given them this marketing edge, we don't want them then to turn around having signed up a bunch of employers and individuals and pull a bait and switch and say, well, thank you very much, Carolinas, for that discount, assuming you were going to get you know, a certain patient volume in, as a benefit back, but we're now going to tier our network. And you know what? Because your discount isn't good enough, you're in the worst tier. So you're in network, but every one of your competitors is more in network than you. And you're not going to get the volume that you budgeted for when you did your financial analysis. And Carolina says, look, we are not trying to stop price discounting. What we're trying to do is to protect the value of our deal. And we don't want a payer to come back after the fact and pull the rug out from under us. On sort of more of their legal arguments, Carolina's focuses on the lack of any actual impact to competition. So Carolina says it's all nice and dandy to muse about how the incentives in this marketplace are going to change and who may want to potentially, under the right circumstances, think about discounting more. But in reality, what's happened? A rule of reason case under Section 1 of the Sherman Act is about an actual adverse impact on competition. Output went down. Prices are at a super competitive level. Consumer welfare in the marketplace, in actual reality, has been hurt. And, you know, Carolina says there's just nothing there. You're not allowed to attack a process 
or try to have the world look better cosmetically in a rule of reason case. You need an actual anti-competitive effect. And then they say, if you look at the actual impact on competition, it's not really everything the Department of Justice is alleging. So they point to the fact that Blue Cross Blue Shield of, Nara, of North Carolina built a narrow network without them. So apparently if the narrow network gets big enough, it triggers, it trips some sort of renegotiation of the reimbursement rates. But for now, there's a narrow network available in town from the largest commercial payer that employers can take advantage of without any change in the Carolinas rates or triggering any termination rights. United Healthcare, says Carolinas, you know, among the other big four commercial payers in Charlotte, let their contract expire in 2015 with Carolinas and went out of network with them for several months, which you know, Carolina says seems to show they may not be a must have because United, which is hardly an unsophisticated entity, decided they didn't need to have them necessarily. Carolinas also points out that the clauses being challenged here aren't uniform. So it's not as if Carolina's management team came up with a set of demands and wrote, wrote some contract language and force-fed that into every payer agreement. Each one of these agreements is different. Um, they trigger differently. Uh, they have different penalties and different incentives based on you know, network tiering and creation of narrow networks or service carve-outs. And Carolina says that shows that this is not an entity with market power, a must-have hospital, jamming the payers and forcing them to take terms they don't want. This is arm's length bargaining back and forth. So at this point, these issues on this motion for judgment on the pleadings are sitting with the federal district judge in North Carolina still. Um, so that decision hopefully will come out soon and maybe somewhat illuminating. Uh, and also obviously with the change in administration, who knows if the new Trump team is going to want to keep pursuing this case. However, if the Department of Justice does still pursue this and they do prevail, it could be a fairly significant case for managed care contracting moving forward. If large, if large providers and provider systems in a market can't use anti-tiering, anti-carve-out, um, anti-narrow network clauses in their agreements, then they are really genuinely faced with the problem Carolina said, which is that they're banking on a certain amount of volume in setting their reimbursement rates, and it could be the rug can be pulled out from under them later. So what would that mean you have to do if you're a provider? What it means is you probably have to hold out for a higher reimbursement rate, because if you can't protect your volume on the back end, you can protect the price you're setting on the front end and it is extremely hard under the antitrust laws to challenge a unilaterally set price. Typically, if you are a strong, desirable healthcare provider and you can get a particular price at the bargaining table, just your price, no terms referencing your rivals or anybody else, that is very, very difficult to challenge under the antitrust laws and you're probably a lot safer than trying to protect the same commercial interests with an anti, you know, tiering or restrictions on narrow networks. And so, you know, I think perversely, this could lead to higher prices uh, because for larger populations, I mean, it's very hard to get around a broad network. If you have large group employer or a national account employer, they simply have too many employees and too many covered lives to function on a narrow network on a large scale. So after, from this though, thinking of payers and payer incentives in their futures is a natural segue to um, what I was kind of the warm up act to, which is the more exciting news going on these days, which Megan is about to talk about, which are the mergers in the health insurance industry. And I guess it was yesterday or the day before's sort of shocker, you know, headline news decision in the Aetna Humana merger. So. Megan, take it away. Thank you, Brock. So as Brock nicely introduced, I'm gonna be talking about the recent um, mergers or attempts to merger, we should say, between large payers. 
Um, in 2015, there was a scramble among the large healthcare payers in the United States to consolidate. Um, this led to um, a July 2nd, 2015 agreement between Aetna and Humana for Aetna to purchase Humana for $37 billion. And then only a few weeks later on July 23rd, 2015, Anthem enters an agreement to buy Cigna for $54 billion. The DOJ began investigating both of these mergers. And in July of 2016, um, in conjunction with various states, the DOJ filed complaints in the U.S. District Court for the District of Columbia to permanently enjoin both of these acquisitions. Each complaint, um, although different, alleges that their respective payer combination will substantially lessen competition, which is a violation of um, Clayton Act Section, Section 7. Um, trials were recently held. Um, the Anthem Cigna trial lasted from late November to early January with um, a little recess around the holidays. And the Aetna Humana merger occurred during the month of December. Um, and as Brock nicely mentioned, we just had a decision from the judge on Monday. So I will be getting to that. But first I'm going to talk about the Anthem Cigna uh, deal. Um, so just to give a little background about the parties to the agreement, um, Anthem is a part of the Blue Cross Blue Shield Association, um, which controls, and it controls the Blues license in 14 states, which actually covers about 39% of the U.S. population. However, outside of Anthem's territory, um, it's still, there are still some ways that it can um, achieve fees and money, um, revenues, as well as possibly get accounts. One of those ways is that, for instance, if a company, a large national employer, moves headquarters um, but wants to stay with Anthem because it used Anthem in the past, although now it's not in a state that is actually part of Anthem's territory, it can ask, you know, whether it's Blue Cross or Blue Shield of North Carolina, say, um, to cede the rights to the account to Anthem. So it is possible that Anthem actually has accounts outside of its territory. In addition, what happens is Anthem can receive blue card fees um, outside of its territory or from accounts that it actually doesn't belong to um, Anthem. And what occurs there is that if the account belongs to another blue, um, but the account's employees are actually getting medical care within Anthem's territory, it gets a fee. And according to the Department of Justice's complaint, um, these fees are not insignificant. Um, in 2014, it is alleged that Anthem received $450 million um, in blue card fees. And so Anthem has 39 million members nationwide and um, has about $78 billion revenue in 2015. Cigna um, operates in all 50 states in the District of Columbia. It has approximately 13 million members and achieved $38 billion in revenue in 2015. Cigna is also known as a um, pair that is growing. Um, and as this slide shows, it actually had 13% compound revenue growth annually over the past six years. Um, so in its complaint that was filed in July, the DOJ alleged that the Anthem Cigna combination will lessen competition in numerous markets, specifically four markets that I'm going to point out. Um, in the interest of time, I'm only going to really dig into two of them. Those are the ones that are asterisks on the slide, but um, I wanted to let you know about the other ones as well. Um, the first is national accounts, and I will be um, talking about this in more detail. And those are accounts in which an employer, these are large employers that have employees in, in more than one state. Um, then it, there was also an allegation that there were certain local um, what we would call Metropolitan Service Areas, MSAs, that would be um, negatively, there would be anti-competitive effects from the comp competition for a large group employers in these MSAs. Um, additionally, um, there were allegations that certain individual public exchanges, uh, specifically in St. Louis and Denver, um, or those areas, um, would be negatively impacted by the combination. Um, however, as the slide indicates, um, this past fall, pursuant to a stipulation 
um, between the parties. The DOJ abandoned this allegation. It reserved its right to bring it feasibly later, but for purposes of narrowing the issues for the upcoming trial and for discovery purposes, it um, was not going forward with this allegation during trial. Um, and lastly, they are also, the complaint also alleged that the purchase of healthcare services, um, what would happen is the purchases of these healthcare services by commercial payers, this market was being affected um, in the sense that it would lead to providers paying or receiving higher or lower reimbursement rates, I should say. Um, other notable allegations with respect to the Anthem uh, Cigna merger that were made in DOJ's complaint that it kind of play throughout, I think, both the trial as well as you can read in the complaint and the findings of fact. There has been no decision yet in, in, this, in this case. But um, sort of this reputation between Anthem versus Cigna. Cigna, the DOJ likes to point out, is an innovator. It's coming up with way, new ways for fee arrangements between providers and payers between employers and payers. Um, it's, it's growing, it's an aggressive competitor, um, and it is known as a high quality per, uh, payer. Whereas um, Anthem is viewed or as viewed by the DOJ and, and in these allegations is, is seemingly not as great of a quality. Although it's big, it's maybe not providing these types of quality, it's not innovating. And that kind of permeates throughout the uh, complaint. There is also this notion of a conflict of interest with other blues. Um, the DOJ raises this question of, okay, well, if you, if this deal goes through and outside of the Anthem, these 14 Anthem states, um, will you be competing against other blues with the Cigna that is there? And will this create a conflict of interest? How does this work? Um, will this enable Cigna and the blue that's in that territory to possibly collude? Um, leading to other antitrust issues. So th that's another kind of idea that sort of permeates throughout the complaint. Um, so to get into more specifics about the national accounts, um, the DOJ's theory is basically, with respect to these large national employers that have employees in multiple states, they're really, um, they're really only four players. And what's gonna happen is when Anthem and Cigna merge, we're down to three. And so what would occur, the other players are Aetna, which I will get to, is already in you know, its own litigation and then leaves United. So really that is, it's a, we're losing competition here. And then what happened is the DOJ looked at this theory with respect to both the 14 territories that, um, that Anthem has the rights to the BCBS as well as the entire nation. And it said that when you look at this, there is gonna be a combined market share, whether you look at it as a nation as a whole or in these 14 territories of at least 50%. Notably, what the DOJ did when it, when it did these market share calculations and it excluded what I'm gonna to talk to, we'll talk about as slice players. And these are regional players that if there's an account um, that a payer has a big payer and in certain states, it might actually have a little slice of that off. For instance, Kaiser might have a part of California, um, even though Anthem might have most of the, most of the rest of the nation um, for this employer. Um, and it excluded these slice players in coming up with that 50%, 50 um, uh, market share. In addition, what Anthem says is, you know, in, there's documents and there's testimony, especially, um, you know, whether it's at trial and depositions that show that these def that the defendants in this case are close rivals for national account clients. Um, some of the, the evidence that emerged is that um, Anthem had this bounty program in which it kind of incentivized its employees to target Cigna accounts or accounts that had lost the Cigna or C that Cigna had and they kind of offered this bounty. Um, they also had a lot of win-loss reports in their documents that really showed when they were losing to Cigna and vice versa. And there was other evidence of this, you know, documentary evidence of the nature of the competition between, between defendants. Um, in response to this, uh, defendants say that slicing is very prevalent and that regional payers compete with defendants all the time, whether it's a Harvard Pilgrim, it's a, it's a Kaiser, and, and they're facing competition from them. They constrain prices 
just as well as the other big national players. Um, they also said in response that these different blues compete with each other. They're not just working in tandem, they're actually competitors. And you can't just say that Anthem is Blue Cross Blue Shield. There's many other Blue Cross Blue Shields across the country as part of this association. Um, and one of their final responses was that, that TPAs, third-party administrators, there's hundreds of these. And they're also competing for these large self-insured accounts and provide these services for these accounts that are self-insured. And a lot of these national accounts are self-insured. Um, so those have been the kind of back and forth with respect to the national account theory. Um, so then there's this theory regarding the purchase of health care from providers. And basically what the DOJ is alleging is that a combined payer of, with Anthem and Cigna can, is going to be very large. And it's going to leverage its size and the amount of enrollees it has um, to receive lower reimbursement rates from providers. In turn, what this is going to lead to is reduced quality of health care, uh, less access to medical care, because what's going to happen is providers are going to say, hey, you know, I'm not making any money, and they're going to exit markets. And it's also going to lead to fewer value-based collaborations between providers and payers. Some of the things that I had been mentioning before was that Cigna has been kind of leading the way in trying to come up with some collaboration about value-based um, arrangements as opposed to just volume arrangements between payers and providers. The defendants respond um, by saying, hey, this is actually a good thing. Lower, if we're getting lower rates from the provider, then we pass that along to the employee, or employer, which in turn it passes along to employees, and therefore consumers are actually paying less for their health care. And this is an efficiency. This is a good, good thing from the, the combination. Um, and it, it actually does ask an interesting question. In a lot of the provider mergers that we have seen over the past few years brought by the Federal Trade Commission, such as um, the hospital merger in Hershey that was blocked, the advocate merger in Chicago that was blocked um, after the FTC brought litigation to um, enjoin those mergers, um, it, the F, one of the big allegations the FTC makes is these giant hospital you know, systems, when they're combined, they can force the payers to pay higher rates, which then are passed along to consumers. So it's sort of an inverse to that. And it, and it, it, it asks an interesting question of the government that you know, with an insurance company that is sort of this middleman um, where you know, maybe it helps consumers on one end but harms the providers, you know, what, what do you do with that? But they brought this allegation, and, and obviously I think the court, the judge in this case, was somewhat confused by this, um, just what the, even the law was, how do you make sense of this, um, where, you know, there's kind of arguments on both sides. And this trial was actually phased, um, where they did, did part of it before the holidays and part of it after. And um, in late December, the court asked before phase two, which would get more into this whole, um, this purchase of healthcare from providers theory um, for the, the parties to submit memorandum, um, additional memorandum kind of laying out what the law is. And they obviously <laughs> had different viewpoints. Um, the DOJ basically said to the court, all we need to show is that this combination will likely increase market power um, and that risks harm to providers. Through lower rates, it could be lower quality. You know, we don't have to actually show a specific what it will do. Um, the defendants, on the other hand, said that the DOJ actually will need to show that this combination will push me reimbursement rates um, below the provider's long-run marginal costs, meaning that that's when they're going to exit markets and it lead to lower care. Just saying that rates might be low, a little lower and therefore that's passed on to consumers isn't enough. Um, it has to show that there's, there's this long-run marginal cost impact. Um, the judge still seemed uncertain about what, what the law is, actually, even on the last day of trial, there was actually a question-answer session sort of asked, I mean, not after the trial ended, but after the sides rested, where the judge kept on asking questions of the parties about this theory. Um, and so it will be interesting to see how the judge rules um, regarding this theory. However, um, it should be important to point out that the DOJ doesn't have to win on this. Um, they just have to prove that 
there could be um, a potential anti-competitive effect in any in any market. It doesn't have to be specifically this one. So the judge, in theory, could could and very well is very likely that the judge could find that the national counts market um, that will uh, the combination will lessen competition and and that's enough and doesn't really necessarily have to decide this. But it does pose an interesting question about. Um, both the DOJ and, honestly, the FTC and sort of the government's position uh, with respect to health care costs and whether, um, you know, whether it's passed along to consumers in one case, it seems to be um, what the DOJ is saying, that's, that's not good, it, it, providers are being hurt, whereas in the other case they're saying consumers are being hurt. So it's an, it's an interesting uh, theory to think about. I, I will interject for just a second with the um, next two CLE words. The second word will be insurance, and the third word is Hamilton. So again, the first word was hospital, the second word is insurance, and the third word is Hamilton. Thanks, Megan. Thank you. Um, so next I'm gonna talk about the Aetna Humana merger and the litigation that is occurring there and which we just received a decision on Monday. Um, so as some background, Aetna has, uh, 23.5 million enrollees and revenues of $60 billion in 2015. Um, and as the DOJ alleges, it is a major grower, growing Medicare Advantage competitor in that space, which becomes important, and I'll get into that. Um, Humana um, is, is somewhat of a smaller, uh, smaller scale, I would say. It's, it's 14 million enrollees and revenues of $54 billion in 2015. But uh, Humana is the second largest Medicare Advantage payer with 3.1 million enrollees. And that's important for, for this litigation. Um, some other facts about this, uh, the agreement that was entered between Aetna and Humana is it actually um, had a $1 billion breakup fee in which Humana had the right, if the deal did not go through before December 31st, 2016, which obviously it did not, um, since we're well into January, that it, it had the right to seek a $1 billion, $1 billion from Aetna. Um, other, other facts about this case that are, are pertinent are that in August, on August 2nd, 2016, the parties entered an asset purchase agreement and an administrative service agreement with Molina Healthcare, which was seen to, um, which they kind of developed as a divestiture candidate, as this litigation and investigation were progressing. Um, and then in August 15, 2016, Aetna made announcements, and you've probably heard about it, that it was planning to leave certain public exchanges. And um, that is interesting because some of the public exchanges that they were threatening to leave um, were the counties at issue um, in one of the theories that the DOJ brings in this case. So um, that becomes an interesting part of the judge's decision. So the DOJ in this, in this litigation alleged that the combined entity will lessen competition in two markets. One is the Medicare Advantage market, and I'm gonna spend more time on that. Um, and the other one is the, the individual public exchanges, specifically in counties in Florida, Georgia, and Missouri. Um, also, as part of these allegations, the DOJ um, said that the proposed uh, divestiture candidate, um, Molina Healthcare, was insufficient to restore competition to the market as, as a um, result of the combination. <coughs> Excuse me. Um, so with respect to the DOJ theory regarding the lessening of competition in the Medicare Advantage space, um, it, it was specific to 364 counties, as I should say, not the entire United States. But what the, United, or what the government is saying is that Medicare Advantage is its own market. Um, it does not, it is traditional Medicare and Medicare Advantage are separate markets for the purposes of analyzing the competitive effects of this merger. Um, it costs less and it offers more benefits than traditional Medicare. Um, traditional Medicare, as you may be aware or not, but um, it, it only offers basic Medicare. You then have to seek, you know, uh, Part D for prescriptions. Uh, you can also get what are med, su med supplement plans from, um, uh, from commercial payers to supplement, whether it's vision, dental, things like that. So um, 
it's saying that this is its own thing and you cannot look at the market as one that also includes what is traditional or fee-for-service Medicare. Um, they said in these 364 counties, the combined entity would have a market share of at least 35%, and in actually 70 of those counties, the share would be 100%. Um, they also alleged, and in, as part of their um, offering during trial, that there's documents, there's testimony that show the intense head-to-head -head competition between Aetna and Humana in this Medicare Advantage space. And lastly, as I hinted to before, that this divestiture candidate, Molina Healthcare, was unlikely to preserve competition. It currently only operates in 41 of the 364 counties. With respect to Medicare Advantage, it is a company that is already in the Medicaid space and, and plays there. But, um, and it only has less than 500 enrollees in the Medicare, for Medicare Advantage. Um, in response, the defendants say, no, 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 Medicare Advantage competes with traditional Medicare. Um, these are alternatives. A senior can choose between Medicare Advantage and they can choose between traditional Medicare and therefore traditional Medicare acts as a constraint on Medicare Advantage. Um, also that Medicare Advantage is um, subject to CMS regulatory oversight and because of this oversight, it actually imposes any, well, as the defendants, um, argue it imposes kind of constraints on the ability of a combined entity to raise price or um, remove services and things of that nature. Um, they also say in response, argue that they compete with many other MAOs or uh, Medicare Advantage organizations and that there was no evidence that, that Aetna and Humana are particularly close competitors. They gave some examples um, in their findings of fact that in in Texas, there's 16 of these MOAs. In North Carolina, there's eight. This isn't a market where it's two players that are combining. Um, they also talk about the ease and prevalence of entry into the Medicare Advantage space. It's different than you know what they're saying a national account might be in our other uh, in the other litigation. Um, that for Medicare Advantage, there are you know a lot of smaller players, and it's it's fairly easy to enter this market. Um, and lastly, they say Molina Healthcare is, um, will be an effective competitor um, and that with the divestiture, they're providing Molina 290,000 enrollees in 21 states. And they're also, as part of that, as I said, there's an administrative services agreement that will help um, kind of get uh, Molina Healthcare rolling in this space. And so on January 23rd, as I alluded to, which is just this past Monday, the district court um, wrote a basically 160 page opinion blocking, um, explaining why it was blocking the merger. Um, and importantly for, for our purposes, the DOJ agreed with, um, with the government, or sorry, the court agreed with the DOJ that traditional Medicare should not be included in the market with Medicare advantages um, with respect to this antitrust analysis. Um, it talked about the fact that Medicare advantages has its distinct characteristics and, and uses, um, which is comes from, uh, you know, old Brook Group case in antitrust uh, kind of jur <laughs> jurisprudence. Um, and kind of talked about how they're different, some of the things I laid out, the, the type of ser services they provide, such as vision, dental, prescription, are part of the package, whereas with traditional Medicare, you kind of have to seek those other things out. Um, importantly, and I'll kind of get to this at the end of my presentation as well, um, the documents and testimony uh, sort of revealed what the judge called industry and public rec recognition of distinct markets between traditional Medicare and Medicare Advantage. Um, for example, um, they, the court mentioned in its opinion that there were just many, many detailed assessments of competition among Medicare Advantage plans um, in the defendant's documents, um, whereas there was very limited amount um, comparing Medicare Advantage to a traditional um, Medicare or MedSup. Um, in addition, there, there were facts such as uh, at these companies, um, they typically, Aetna and Humana, have a Medicare Advantage sort of business unit that is separate from their Medicare, sup, or, yeah, Medicare supplement business units, that they kind of think of them differently, that they, um, in their financial reporting, report revenues 
as distinct businesses. So there was just sort of this internal um, documents and the way these business functions that sort of indicated to the court that they think of traditional Medicare as separate from Medicare Advantage. Um, also, the court pointed to some switching data, which was analysis done by experts on both sides. Um, and it, it said that, you know, what it saw, and it mostly took, I would have to say, the, the DOJ's expert's word on this, was that the companies, uh, they rarely switch if you're a Medicare Advantage um, to a different plan, but if they do, they go to another Medicare Advantage plan. If you're in a Medicare Advantage plan, you're rarely switching to uh, a traditional Medicare plan. Um, also, what the judge pointed out is, based on using the defendant's expert data, the DOJ's expert determined, and this is a test called the hypothetical monopolist test, um, that a hypothetical monopolist could profitably impose a small but so significant, and what is called a small but significant non-transitory increase in price, which we refer to as a SNP, without losing customers to, to traditional Medicare. So it ran an analysis basically saying that a hypothetical monopolist in this Medicare Advantage space could impose a price increase without losing really a significant amount of enrollees to traditional Medicare, and therefore this increase would be profitable to the company. And based on these factors, it said tr traditional Medicare is not in this market, and we are looking at it solely as a Medicare Advantage market. Um, and this is important because based on that market, then you start doing analysis of what happens in that specific market. And it, it concluded that the DOJ established a prima facie case that the combination will have anti-competitive effects. Um, and so it ran some various uh, market share calculations, one being what is called the HHI index, and it shows um, that when you look at the combined entity, that it will presumptively, due to the, the concentration in various markets, it presumptively enhances market power. Um, moreover, the combination results in elimination of an aggressive competitor. Um, as I kind of indicated, Aetna was a growing kind of competitor, is a growing competitor in this space, and is known as being aggressive and offering um, plans um, at lower rates and, incent you know, is, is a good competitor, has helped competition. And when you do this, when, this, when these companies combine, you're losing this aggressive competitor. Um, the court also found that head-to-head -head analyses revealed that Aetna's presence decreases Humana's market share. So when Aetna entered into a market, that Humana's market share was dropping. Um, and also there was a regression analysis performed by both experts, but the, the court sort of relied on the regression analysis of the DOJ's expert um, that predicts that there would be a 60% increase in premiums as a result of the acquisition. Um, and this would result in $500 million per year harm to see both seniors and taxpayers. Um, the court also, um, because there was the presumption that this was anti-competitive, the court then in turn said that uh, the defendant's arguments did not rebut this presumption of anti-competitive effects. Um, with respect to the argument that CMS regulates Medicare Advantage and therefore um, the, the parties are constrained in their ability to increase price, um, the court didn't really buy that. It, it, it did acknowledge that CMS is there and that it is regulated. However, um, some of the, the rules imposed, um, for instance, one of the rules imposed is sort of a, a margin. You cannot move past, you cannot have such a big profit margin when it comes to Medicare Advantage. But what that does is for a, um, a big payer, it looks at its Medicare Advantage plans across, you know, all of its um, areas and all of its enrollees. So it is possible to have some increase in certain areas, but at the whole will still be below that that margin threshold that CMS requires. So that was one example where, you know, yes, it does impose some reg regulatory restrictions, but it's not enough to, um, you know, rebut this presumption that there's going to be anti-competitive effects as a result of the merger. Um, it also went into detail about the fact that it did not believe that entry into the Medicare Advantage market would be timely, likely, or sufficient in order to combat the merger of these two large Medicare Advantage providers. Um, 
And as another part of this, it also detailed, as I said, it was 160 pages, so there was many details, um, as why Molina Healthcare was not an adequate divestiture candidate. Um, and one of the reasons why was that there was actually contemporaneously prepared business documents from, from Molina's own board and an executive that undermined the argument that it could successfully compete. And that included these documents that indicated that it was sort of unsure of itself competing in this space. Um, so that was one, one thing against it. Um, there was also a concern that this was, that Molina was getting these assets for a pretty low price. Um, and this concern, this raises concerns to a court um, because it kind of seems like, you know, at any human or just sort of having a fire sale, and they're just trying to get rid of some assets in order to make this litigation go away, um, and, and that they didn't necessarily they didn't think it through or didn't offer it to the best candidate. They just offered it, they sold it to whoever was a willing buyer. Um, and lastly, one of the other uh, big points that the court made was that Molina, as I said, doesn't have many Medicare Advantage enrollees. Um, presently, and that it tr has tried in the past to actually kind of really enter this space and um, get more enrollees and has not succeeded. So it doesn't have a track record um, of success in this space. Again, Molina primarily uh, is in the Medicaid space, not the Medicare space. And I also wanted to talk, although I, I didn't get into all the theories um, behind this just in the interest of time, but talk to you about um, the conclusion the court reached that the, com the combination will substantially lessen competition on the public exchanges in three Florida counties. Um, so the initial complaint alleged that there would be um, harm to competition in 17 counties across three states, Florida, Georgia, and Missouri. Um, when the judge wrote the decision, it focused on three counties, and I'll, I'll sort of get into why that is. So as I hinted at before, um, in August of this year, Aetna came out kind of saying it was going to leave some of these public exchanges, not just in these 17 counties, but in various states. Um, and basically, uh, you know, there was, there was some doubters about why, why it was doing it, 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 specifically for the counties that were alleged to, to be, um, that were alleged to result in anti-competitive effects as a result of the comp uh, combination. And so the court looked at this and um, decided based on the evidence that it, it did show that Aetna was saying it was going to leave these markets in 2017 to approve its litigation position. Um, and basically what it came down to was one, I would say one particular email, although there was other evidence of an, of an Aetna executive that was, um, you know, produced during discovery kind of saying that, hey, yes, we're leaving a bunch of these markets because they're not profitable, that's a business reason, totally okay. But then it made a comment to the effect of, yeah, and we definitely have to leave these 17 others kind of as a result of the DOJ. Um, and the court saw this as, you know, and is doing this to improve its litigation position. And I think that kind of put the court in a certain frame, frame to not really, to discredit uh, the other um, arguments that Aetna and Humana made with respect to um, the public exchanges. Um, and also what the court then had to do was kind of not only look at, hey, what is the reasoning behind this, but, you know, it was making a decision as to whether it would substantially lessen competition. So if Aetna is not really playing in these markets, is it going to substantially lessen competition? And it went through the evidence. And it determined that, it, you know, due to other business factors, like I said, there it was losing money in certain areas, that, um, that some of these 17 counties, yes, there were business reasons why it probably would not likely, um, you know, offer Medicare Advantage, or sorry, not Medicare Advantage, public, it would go off the exchange, I should say, um, in some of those counties um, for business reasons. But what it found that there were three counties in Florida that it was actually likely in the future it would have probably would continue um, to offer um, or to be on the public exchange in these Florida counties. And then what the court did is it looked at the market share cal uh, concentration calculations as well as evidence of head-to-head -head competition um, to establish uh, the prima facie case that 
there would be anti-competitive effects. There were high, what we call HHI index, market concentration. There were documents showing that they compete against each other um, and that the defendants were unable to rebut this presumption with the evidence presented at trial. Um, so in closing, uh, I just wanted to kind of reiterate a, a few points as to what really comes out. There was a lot of information I obviously just said. Um, and I think one of the, the most critical points you see when reading this district decision, when going through the findings of facts in this case, when looking over um, evidence presented during the trials, is that um, documents matter. Internal documents matter. And um, it, it's sort of hard to get, escape them. Courts really rely on things that are contemporaneously prepared. So for instance, if you're creating a strategy document and, and you or you know, even just a, a review of the business and you talk about your competitors and you talk about the spaces you play in and you use words such as, we're in this market and these are, these are our toughest competitors and you list competitors. And then later you're you know, possibly being investigated uh, by the Department of Justice, the Federal Trade Commission for a combination and you try to backtrack on that and say, oh no, no, they're not our big competitor or we have tons of other competitors. We just didn't list them on this, on this uh, you know, document, the strategy document we made. It's sort of hard to backtrack from that. Um, and, and it could lead to um, loss of credibility, possibly your, your expert who has to explain these documents, you know, is presented with a document and you're saying the, there's these 100 competitors, but on this internal document they prepared, there's only five. What do you say to that? You know, there can be some credibility issues. So I think it is very important to, you know, pay attention to the, to what's being said in, the, in your documents and what you're saying about the spaces in which you compete, who your competitors are, um, because it can be hard to then have to backtrack from that later on if, um, if you're in the midst of an investigation by the government. Um, the other uh, takeaway that I would have to say is that um, in light of the, the Aetna Humana decision, um, I, I believe it is it's pretty unlikely that the Anthem Cigna merger um, will uh, get the green light from the judge. I, I could foresee an opinion coming down rather shortly um, blocking that merger as well. And so I think um, one of the things you could maybe expect in the future is that um, these, these insurance companies are, I guess, will, have gotten, will get the message that they cannot merge with each other, these you know, big national players. So they might start targeting um, some sort of that next tier down. And so in the future, we might uh, start seeing some combinations between these large players and sort of that next, next tier down. Um, since uh, the government seems to uh, want to prevent the ones between the big, the biggest players, and so that that is what I have today. Okay. Great, thanks, Megan. Um, I'll go ahead and give the fourth CLE course code, and it will be competition. So again, your four words were hospital, insurance, Hamilton, and competition. So I have here on the screen again my email, um, Kristen. Michaela, it's Michaela K, M C C A L L A K at pepperlaw.com. Just email me and I will send you the uh, CLE form and we'll get your uh, credit process. Well, thank you very much, everybody. And uh, just in the minute or so we have left, uh, Barack or Megan, any prognostications on what's going to happen with FTC and DOJ under the Trump administration? I mean, it is. A little bit hard to say. The one thing we do know about the Trump administration is that a man named Joshua Wright is head of their antitrust transition. He is a former FTC commissioner. He was a very outspoken critic of Obama's FTC commissioner appointees. Um, he's an interesting guy. He's a PhD economist uh, and a fairly sophisticated thinker, but he has expressed a lot of skepticism of FTC enforcement actions that sort of push the envelope as to what is genuinely harming consumers and competition as opposed to what, you know, you might call foul play, bad, sort of bad, tortious type action by competitors. Um, so if he's any indication, we might see um, more of a return to a very economist and economic fundamentals driven policy, um, less concerns around sort of fair conduct or fairness in the FTC Section 5, you know, sense of the term. 
uh, than we've had in the past. Great. Thank you very much for that, and thank you all for joining us. We're now at the hour, and we appreciate all of your attendance at this Pepper Hamilton Healthcare Antitrust webinar. We're adjourned.